Dartfeld's childhood was marred by the burning down of his hometown and the death of his parents at the hands of the Black Monster, which of course explains his hatred for energy drinks. He is an offensive unit, brandishing a broadsword and fire magic to burn through his enemies, and his primary weaknesses are his middling magic defense and speed. He's also a required party member, and unfortunately the new remaster does nothing to change this. So today, we're going to examine his value as a character when compared to his comrades. We ask, how good is Dart actually? The relative strength of Dart's human form changes throughout the game. In terms of physical strength, his power level compared to his peers improves as the game progresses. His physical prowess is at first somewhat middling. He has good additions, but a lower attack stat than Rose and Ash, <laughs> but a higher attack than Hashel and Shanna. However, as the game goes on, his strength growth increases, allowing him to surpass Rose around levels in the mid-30s. Hashel's strength, though, eventually surpasses Dart's, and Grandpa's higher speed allows him more chances to strike, leading to overall higher physical damage. But Dart makes up for a lot with his excellent additions. Quite early in the game, he gets access to Blazing Dynamo, which has a 450% attack multiplier and is on par with the final additions of Rose and Hashel. He also gets his most powerful weapon, the Soul Eater, reasonably early in the game. But this weapon is a huge drain, a suck fest, a health hazard. And by that I mean this weapon gives him an enormous power boost at the expense of continuous damage. This drawback forces him to either not use speed boosting equipment or frequently heal, wasting precious turns and lowering the party's overall damage. And unfortunately, his second best weapon, the Claymore, is a huge power loss, and it's quite noticeable when you compare it to the penultimate weapons of the other characters. So physically, Dart is good but not great, forced to choose between power and convenience. And on the magical side, Dart is initially less powerful than his female counterparts and is the best magic user among the boys. And as the game progresses, Dart's magic skill overtakes Rose's and Hashel follows suit. Ultimately though, Dart's talent is wasted on magic as there are other characters who perform far better in that role, namely Shanna and Meru, both because of their high magic stats and their high speed, allowing them to deal massive damage by spamming consumable magic items at a very high rate. Defensively, Dart is also a generalist. All of his defensive stats are in the middle of the pack, but his higher than average HP affords him excellent bulk. On the physical side, he is eclipsed by Ash and Kongol, who both boast higher HP and physical defense and equaled by Hashel. He's also far more physically bulky than any of the female characters, but on the magic side, it's a little more complicated. When compared to Kongol and Lavitz, though, he's clearly more magically bulky. Lavitz, though, can mitigate all damage with his Dragoon skills, and Kongol has a huge HP pool, meaning they both are less magically frail than they might seem. Dart is approximately equal to Hashel in magical bulk, and definitely loses out to Shanna. A comparison to Meru, though, is not as straightforward. Meru's health pool is far lower, so her higher magic defense is far less impactful. This leads to their overall magic resistance being approximately equal. However, Meru is once again Again, favored with a higher speed stat. That allows her to recover health more quickly with the defend command or with healing items if she's truly in a bind. So in human form, Dart lies somewhere in the middle of the pack. He can do good damage, but as a generalist, he's never quite able to compete with the other hard hitters of the game, and his most powerful weapon hinders him by continuously draining his health. Dart's Dragoon form suffers from many of the same issues that his physical form suffers from. He has middle-of-the-road attack and magic stats, and like all other Dragoons, speed boosts from any items he owns do not apply to his Dragoon form. On the plus side, though, his Soul Eater weapon will not drain his health while he's transformed. This allows him to take full advantage of its power without sacrificing survivability. His physical damage in Dragoon form is excellent, though he unfortunately only receives 150% base damage bonus in this form, limiting his power. Still, though, his Dragoon attacks can outdamage his regular additions if performed perfectly. However, Dart has better things to do when Dragooned than attack. Which is a nice segue into Dart's Dragoon magic. Now unfortunately, the base magic attack boost that Dart gets from his Dragoon form is a paltry 150%. His spells though make up for this weakness. His initial magic, Flame Shot, is a 50% damage spell and that power level is on par with the spells of other characters in the game. But in the early game, it's never the best choice with Rose around since she she can deal more damage than Dart can with her level 1 spell, which has an added bonus of providing a party-wide heal. His second magic, Explosion, is a 25% damage spell that attacks all enemies. And while this spell can be useful in destroying minor enemies in a boss battle, its lower power level makes it suboptimal. It's better to save Dart's MP so that he can use higher level spells. A far more efficient solution to minor enemies is to have one of your female party members or Dart himself throw a consumable magic item. 
Speaking of thrown items, do me a favor and throw your mouse at the like button and subscribe to my channel. It really helps my videos get to more people, and when I see a lot of subscribers from a particular video, I know to make more content like it. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Dart's third magic is Final Burst, which turns him into a fiery member of the Fantastic Four. Toasty! Final Burst is a 75% spell that costs 30 MP, and it can dish out impressive damage to single targets. It's particularly potent when paired with the Special Command, and the plethora of water-based bosses in this game, along with a low number of fire-based enemies, makes this a great choice for bosses. It outdamages his Dragoon attack by far, and it can be used to chunk down bosses or used as a Hail Mary when resources are all spent and you need to deal a final blow. Dart's final spell is Red-Eyed Dragon. This spell attacks all enemies and at first glance appears to be the most powerful spell in the game. However, it contains an unfortunate typo that has not yet been fixed in any version of the game. It actually is not a 175% damage attack, but rather a 75% damage attack. Like all other dragon summons, it does create its own special field, boosting its damage significantly. However, it almost completely drains Dart's MP pool. This forces him to restore magic points if he's going to use another magic attack. Thus, in powerful single target situations, Final Burst is almost always the superior option unless you have a surplus of MP restoratives and choose not to special. Defensively, Dart gains huge boosts in Dragoon form, making him extremely resistant to all but the most powerful water spells. With any kind of healing, he'll likely have no problem staying alive to dish out a consistently high level of damage. This means that a defensive comparison to all of the other characters in the game is far less meaningful. The two exceptions, though, are Shanna and Kongol. Kongol is still far more physically bulky than Shulk is. I mean, Kongol is still far more physically bulky than Dart is, and Shanna maintains far more bulk on the magical side. Dart's Dragoon form is excellent, primarily due to Final Burst and his increased bulk. However, his other Dragoon attacks and spells represent a damage loss by comparison. There are also other characters who have more utility, better offensive magic potential, and more speed, and therefore are clearly better choices for a Dragoon. So overall, how good is Dart actually? His physical attacks are excellent, and he has strong Dragoon magic attacks that can quickly deplete an enemy's health. His status as an early Dragoon means he'll get his best spells early, and because he's in the party for every battle, he can potentially overcome his weaknesses by simply gaining more experience and levels than his comrades. His biggest weakness is his middling speed, which makes his mediocrity more apparent. With his best weapon, the Soul Eater, he has to choose between speed and survivability. Other characters, though, have strong weapons that have no downside. He's good, but he's definitely not the best. Lavitz is by far the most buff character in The Legend of Dragoon, which of course explains how he was able to seduce King Albert. Oh. He primarily focuses on physical prowess brandishing a polearm, but his magical attack and defense are relatively weak. However, he compensates well for this with unique skills shared with no one else in the game. So today, we're going to examine his value as a character when compared to his comrades. And later in the video, I'll talk about one of the best strategies that you can use with Lavitz. We ask, how good is Lavitz? Actually. Lavitz is consistently strong as a human throughout the game. In terms of physical strength, he is almost unmatched. His physical prowess is exceeded only by that of Kongol. However, both units are let down by their speed. This means that even though Lavitz attacks are powerful, he'll get fewer turns to act than characters like Hashel and Meru. They both have weaker physical damage than Lavitz throughout the game, but later use their agility to bridge that gap. But he largely makes up for this with excellent additions and weapon options. He eventually gets access to Flower Storm, which has a 500% attack multiplier and is available very early in the game. This allows Lavitz to max out its power before many characters even have access to their final edition at all, which gives him an enormous power boost. His weapons are also more consistently powerful than those of his allies. His Partisan Spear, available even before the end of the game, boasts a powerful 56 attack, and his ultimate weapon has an attack stat of 65. When combined with his massive personal attack and Flower Storm, he can dish out some incredible damage numbers. The flip side, though, is that on the magical side, Lavitz suffers immensely. His magic stat is the second worst for the entire game, beating only Kongol. Essentially, Albert should never be using magic in human form. But one person who should be using magic is you. To like this video and subscribe to my channel, which helps all of my videos in the YouTube algorithm. And it's absolutely free. I really appreciate your help, and thank you so much for supporting my channel. Defensively, Lavitz is 
excellent on the physical side of things. He beats out all characters except Kongol, whose massive HP pool and gargantuan physical defense stat have no peer. But in terms of magical defense, Albert loses to all other characters. While his magic defense stat is technically only the second worst, Kongol's high HP pool means he's likely to take similar, if not less, percent damage when attacked with magic. But all is not as it seems, and we'll talk a little bit more about his defenses when we get to the Dragoon section. But in any case, as I alluded to before, Lavitz's speed stat is what truly holds him back. Having the second lowest speed stat in the game means he gets lapped by Meru and Hashel, and they are his main competition in the damage department due to their high speed, excellent final additions, and in Meru's case, stellar magic aptitude. So in human form, Lavitz is a powerful physical attacker with great defense. He's held back by his poor stats on the magical side and his abysmal speed statistic. While Lavitz's human form has marked weaknesses, notably its speed and magical defense, Lavitz's Dragoon form has some unique characteristics that make him a peak performer. Offensively, his Dragoon form does excellent physical damage due to his fantastic base strength, though he unfortunately only receives a 150% base damage boost when transformed. His high attack damage, though, is hindered by his poor speed, which is apparently going to become a theme in this video. Even worse for him is the fact that equipment stat boosts do not apply in Dragoon form. This means that he is completely stuck with his base speed. However, Dragoon magic is where Lavitz begins to look a little more promising. His level 1 Dragoon magic is Wingstorm and at first glance, it seems like a great spell. It's a wind attack with 25% power against all enemies. This means that it can be good for defeating mobs of smaller enemies or for killing boss sidekicks. However, Lavit's magic stat is abysmally low, even with his 200% magic multiplier he gets in Dragoon form. This means it's rarely worthwhile to use this spell when you have the option of using a consumable item with a more magically adept character. But his level 2 Dragoon magic changes everything. Rose Storm is a 20 M MP cost spell that halves all damage to the party for three turns. This one spell single-handedly fixes Lavitz's poor magic bulk and any survivability issues your entire team might have. Kongol's low magic defense? Who cares? Meru's low physical defense? Not a problem. Shanna's low HP? She'll live. The only downside is that the timer on this skill counts down individually for each character each time they take a turn. So if Meru takes three turns and Lavitz has only had one, her shield shielding will expire while Lavitz remains. This isn't too much of an issue though, since the spell costs very little, so it can be renewed pretty liberally. His third magic, Gaspless is a 100% power wind attack against a single enemy, and while this could be a good choice for earth bosses, Lavit's low magic attack means he's better off saving his magic points for more casts of Rose Storm. Enabling the entire party to act more aggressively will ultimately lead to fewer turns wasted healing and more turns doing damage. But imagine if this attack were on Shanna or Meru, it would be absolutely broken. His final magic, Jade Dragon, is probably his least useful. It's a 75% attack that targets all enemies. As all dragons do, it summons a special field to boost its own damage, but again, Lavitz has no business casting any offensive magic in Dragoon form. Rose Storm on its own breaks the game, and Lavitz's terrible magic stat ruins the damage that Jade Dragon might do, and it uses almost all of his magic points, taking away potential casts of Rose Storm, so saving his magic points and using them only for Rose Storm is probably the best way to go. Defensively, Lavitz gains massive defense boosts in Dragoon form that are only made greater by Rose Storm, almost completely mitigating his poor magic bulk. And of course, his physical bulk is made even more amazing by these boosts. All that being said, Lavitz's lack of any amazing offensive prowess in Dragoon form above and beyond his human form opens him up to a unique strategy that I mentioned in my tips and tricks video for The Legend of Dragoon. By the way, I'll link that video in the description in case you haven't seen it yet. The strategy is the Dragoon level 1 strategy. By keeping Lavitz's Dragoon level at level 1 and always Dragooning at level 1, he can use Rose Storm and then immediately revert back to human form. Now, the disadvantage to this strategy is that he'll lose his Dragoon defense boosts, but the advantage of this strategy is that he'll have everyone's damage anyway and then get any boosts from his items back. In case I forgot to mention it earlier, while transforming gives you huge stat boosts, it also nullifies any bonus effects that you have 
uh, from your equipment. So reverting back to human form then opens up many options. For example, you could give Lavitz an MP restoring accessory so that he can always have enough MP for Rose Storm. Or, and this is my personal favorite way to play him, you can give him the bandit ring and the bandit shoes to patch up his terrible speed stat. This will let him act far more quickly and dish out a ton of damage, but only when he is not in Dragoon form. And his speed will be good enough that he'll be able to recast Rose Storm as soon as it wears off. Lavitz's Dragoon form is top tier defensively due to Rose Storm and his massive defense boosts. This allows him to enable the party rather than focusing on his own personal damage and therefore increasing party-wide damage as a whole. However, for offense, he's best left in his human form where his physical attacks and additions can really shine. So overall, how good is Lavitz actually? In human form, his physical offense and defense are excellent, and his magical prowess is absolute garbage. But the utility he provides in Dragoon form is game-breakingly good, allowing the party's speedy glass cannons to unleash their full offensive might. He is let down somewhat by a low speed stat and poor magic offense, but his ability to boost party damage by making defense a non-issue is well worth his loss of personal damage. Shanna is the Legend of Dragoon's basic bitch, which explains why she loves pumpkin spice lattes, doesn't season her chicken, and always asks for mild when selecting her spice level at an Indian restaurant. Appropriately, she is the Vanilla Dragoon. The Cheesecake Factory Salad Dragoon. The White Silver Dragoon. Some believe her to be a godsend given her supreme magical ability and healing acumen, and all the rest actually use their brains to draw logical conclusions from available data. But in all seriousness, she does have some unique qualities that cause her enemies to quiver with anticipation. So today, we're going to examine her potential in battle. We ask, how bad is Shanna actually? Shanna's human form is quite different from that of the rest of the cast. It's an inarguable fact that she has the worst physical attacks in the game by at least an order of magnitude. And even if she didn't have the worst attack stat in the game, which she does, her attacks would still be the weakest in the game by far, which they already are. And the reason for this is additions, or rather Shanna's lack of them. For some reason, the devs decided that Shanna, as the only long-range character, doesn't get additions at all. So while everyone else is getting multiple of 400 to 600 percent and saying things like Shanna uses just 100 percent of her attack power and says ha indeed for the record she's laughing at you because you decided to use a physical attack with her you made a bad choice and you should feel bad on the plus side though she does have the shortest additions in the game which is not a plus side because that was a joke ha! She compensates for her bottom-of-the-barrel physical attacks with her stellar magical abilities. She has the highest magic stat in the game and very high speed, second only to Meidu. She can therefore do huge damage with magic, and she can do it fast. In the early game, she's actually reasonably overtuned and does far more damage with magic than anyone else does with their physical attacks. So if you want someone to be a pure magic user in human form, Shanna is a great choice. The big drawback, however, and what makes Shanna less useful, is that using magic in human form requires the use of consumable items, and Legend of Dragoon has an item cap of 32. Healing items, repeat items, status healing items, and consumable magic items all contribute to that cap. So unless you want to only have magic items in your inventory, it's going to be difficult to have enough items to keep Shanna stocked, meaning you'll eventually be forced to- Top! 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 Really? Interestingly though, her unique traits make her a fantastic choice to enhance a speed run. There's no time for tedious addition grinding in a speed run. Therefore, the most powerful Dragoon spells will be inaccessible, and Shanna will do the highest damage of the entire party with her magic. Furthermore, if all of the other party members are allowed to die in boss battles, Shanna receives all of the experience, launching her levels and her magic stat to stratospheric heights. Thus, she'll massively boost her magic damage and, more importantly, her survivability. While this didn't really affect Shanna's rank in my new and improved character tier list, a video that you should definitely watch after you finish this one. I think it's an interesting quirk that gives her a fun niche. Defensively, the split between physical and magic is about the same as her offense. Her physical bulk is abysmal. She's paper. Well, 
feathers. But because she has the highest health of all of the girls, she's actually the best of them at taking blows. The boys, though, all have her beat in this department. Ooh, phrasing. Her magic defense, though, is sky high. The only person who comes close to her magical bulk is Meru, but Meru's terrible health means that Shanna has her completely beat in terms of magic defense. And the final thing that sets Shanna apart is her speed. She has the second highest speed in the game. That, combined with her magic attack, means that she can dish out immense damage with magical items, particularly when equipped with speed boosting equipment. So in human form, Shanna's physical offense and defense are pitiable due to her low stats and her lack of additions to supplement her damage output. But her magical prowess is unmatched, allowing her to kill things fast as long as you have the requisite magical items and take a ton of magical hits. And these qualities are extremely useful in a speedrun of the game, but might be less useful in a more casual playthrough. Shanna's human form and dragoon form largely share the same strengths and detriments. However, the stat boosts she receives and her interesting library of spells patch up some of her weaknesses, allowing her to perform well despite her deficiencies. Offensively, her dragoon form, like her human form, is physically terrible. She receives a mind-blowing 200% base strength boost in dragoon form, which literally does not matter because she still has no additions to boost her damage output. This means her physical attacks in dragoon form hit like a wet noodle. And and you might be thinking, well, just use magic. And I will talk about why that's not so simple right after I discuss the spells themselves. Shanna's first spell is Moonlight. It provides a full heal to any one party member. And if that party member is dead, it revives them and restores 50% of their HP. It does not heal any status effects, though. This spell can be very useful at the beginning of the game, but it has a couple of issues, which I will discuss in a little bit. Shanna's level 2 spell is Star Children. It is a 25% power spell that attacks all enemies. And I take issue with this spell. Most of the hardest battles in the game are boss battles, which require a ton of single target damage. Some of the bosses do have minions, but once they're gone, it's just the boss. So to give a character who literally only has the potential for magic offense, this spell instead of a single target offensive spell doesn't make much sense to me. And I'll circle back to this as well in just a little bit. Her third spell is Gates of Heaven. And that is a convenient segue to invite you to pass through the gate of the Tantacles Discord. My Discord is the best place to get updates about my content and to yell at me because I said something wrong in a video. That's real-time feedback. And if you're feeling particularly enthusiastic about my channel, you can click the join button. Becoming a channel member gets you early access to my videos and allows you to vote in polls to help determine what video I'll produce next. On top of that, you'll be supporting the channel, helping me to make more and better RPG content. And even if you can't afford to support me financially, likes and shares are extremely helpful. So please hit that like button and say ha, just like Shanna would. Thank you for supporting my channel. I appreciate every single one of you. Back to Gates of Heaven. This is a 50% heal for the entire party. My good friends in the Legend of Dragoon Discord helped me test that one out, and I will leave a link to that Discord in the doodly-doo. The description doesn't say it, but this spell also revives any downed party members. But this spell doesn't cure any status effects, which I find disappointing. Her final spell is the White Silver Dragon Summon. This spell does 100% magic damage, and heals all allies to full health. Yes, full health this time. It does not revive anyone and it does not heal status. It is an amazing spell and is one of the two highest damaging spells in the game. If you're going to use Shanna, this is a spell to use whenever you possibly can. But now, let's talk about why Shanna's Dragoon magic, as well as her overall Dragoon offense, is disappointing. It really all comes down to opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the potential that you lose by choosing one thing instead of another. And since in The Legend of Dragoon you can and use three characters out of seven, you have to choose the characters that give you the best possible potential compared to the other characters. So overall, what do you gain with Shanna? You gain the ability to use strong magic attacks in human and dragoon form, and you gain the ability to heal, and heal more, and then do big PP damage and heal at the expense of almost all of your magic points. And if you use her level two spell to do damage, it really doesn't do a ton of damage compared to what other characters can do. But the question is, how much healing do you actually need? Well, actually a lot less than Shanna provides and her level 3 spell is actually the same as a healing breeze item, and that heals everyone for half HP. No revival, but hey, take along a couple angels prayers. And remember, Shanna can't stay in Dragoon form forever. Eventually, she has to attack, and that's a damage loss no matter what way you slice it. And someone has to restore her MP, which is a damage loss. And if you want to use magic items to help her do magic attacks in human form, you eventually run out. And then she has to attack, which is bad. And also, 
a damage loss. So then the question is, what do you lose by using Shanna? Well, the answer is that you lose the opportunity to use Meru. When her additions are complete, she does a ton of physical damage, and she can also do a ton of damage to bosses with her magic. Not quite as much as Shanna, but a lot. She also can heal the entire party for half HP and heal any status effects at the same time. That's something that Shanna can't do, and Meru can do that for 10 fewer MP than Shanna's level 3 spell, which is just healing. And if you don't feel like using Meru's Dragon Summon, which is her highest damaging spell, she has two very powerful magic spells that both do excellent damage and don't require you to restore her MP several times. Basically, Meru does everything Shanna can do magically, just a teensy bit worse, but has a ton more physical offense, more efficient but slightly less magical offense, and less redundant healing. And that makes Shanna, to me, seem pretty mediocre by comparison. And also, Meru has a little bit more speed, which means she gets more attacks. And okay, you might be thinking, well, Shanna can revive, that's something that Meru can't do. But physically, Shanna and Meru are both quite frail. I mean, Meru is more frail, but still, my point stands. And that means that they're both the most likely to be knocked out when they take physical damage. Granted, Shanna is much more magically bulky due to her higher HP and her higher magic defense, but Meru can take magical hits pretty well. So when you're choosing between Meru and Shanna, why not get you one that can do both? Yes, Shanna is an extreme magic specialist, but Meru is a jack-of-all-trades whose abilities are all at an extremely high level. And furthermore, the item cap also acts as a sore spot for opportunity cost. To use Shanna's best magic more than once, you have to restore her magic points. Otherwise, she's stuck with just her physical attacks, which are garbage. So one viable strategy is to have her transform and just continually use her dragon summon while all of the other characters heal her magic points. But that leaves no buffer in case someone gets one-shotted or afflicted with a status, which Shanna can't cure. Ultimately, the spread of Shanna's abilities and stats are far too skewed towards healing and magic for her to be a truly great character. So in Dragoon form, Shanna is a great healer, but lacks versatility in terms of the offense she can provide. And she unfortunately sucks at providing physical offense in Dragoon form. So overall, how bad is Shanna actually? Well, she's usable, but the whole is not greater than the sum of her 0-0 parts. Physically, she has terrible stats and no additions, which make her do a ton less damage than everyone else in the party. This is only somewhat made up for by her incredible magic prowess and the fact that she has a ton of healing potential. But the biggest thing she has going for her is that if you level her Dragoon form, you will have finally proven to your nagging spouse that you are, in fact, capable of doing chores. Does that mean that you're going to start taking out the garbage, though? Probably not. You're lazy, and you always have been. She's the cream of the crop in speedrunning, but in more casual play, her use ultimately leads to a damage loss when compared to other characters, particularly Meru. It's common knowledge that Rose is a serial killer, which explains why she's no longer allowed within 500 feet of Lucky the Leprechaun. She's most notable for a shifting stat progression that often leaves players baffled as to her value as a fighter, which by extension, leaves many wondering how she best fits into a team, and where her alliances lie. Her magical abilities, which are vastly different from any other character in the game, straddle the line between all-out attacker and support, further complicating her role. She's been working hard for a while, and she deserves a break. So today, we're going to let her have access to her account Chocula, ignore her existential angst, and examine her battle potential. We ask, how bad is Rose, actually? While it's clear that Rose has deep, dark secrets, her combat ability is immediately apparent when she joins the party. She's the first member of the party to have a Dragoon spirit, and she offers a ton of value to the team. And offensively, her stats start out quite strong. When she joins the party, Rose is one of four members and is clearly overall the strongest. She initially has higher physical strength than Darth and is on par with Lavitz. The third character she initially competes with is Shanna, and Rose is definitely physically stronger. By the way, I've already made guides on these three characters, and I will link all three of them in the doodly-doo. As the story of the Legend of Dragoon unravels, so too does Rose's physical dominance. In turn, every single character except Shanna develops better physical offense than Rose, even Meru. But the reason for this is not only Rose's poor stat growth, but also the poor attack stats of her weapon. Her one saving grace, however, is that she's the second character in the game to gain access to her final edition, Demon's Dance. It has a 500% attack multiplier at maximum level. Mastering this edition 
Jensen multiplies Rose's attack power to a point no one else can initially match. But once other characters get access to their final additions, Rose is toast. Even slower characters are able to outdamage her. Until the very end of the game, when she gets access to the Dragon Buster, she is truly physically inferior. But even then, this weapon is only available in the final boss battle, and other characters can still outdamage her overall. Hashel has higher speed and a weapon that can boost his damage substantially, Meru has perky step and a blisteringly fast speed stat, among other strengths, and even Kongol can outdamage her for most of the game given his gargantuan attack stat and fantastic weapon options. He has his own special challenges, which I talked about a little bit in my Ultimate Legend of Dragoon character tier list, but this is not his analysis. This belongs to Rose, so we're going to push him aside for now and talk about her. Rose's magic trajectory is quite similar to her physical trajectory. At the journey's outset, she has the best magic stat, and it's even about 25% higher than Shanna's, and that's quite surprising given that Shanna literally only excels in magic. But Rose's growth erodes in that arena as well, and she eventually even loses out to Hashel. And Hashel's higher speed means he's going to get more turns, making him the superior option for enemies that can't be one punch to death. And this puts Rose in a difficult position. At the beginning of the game, her offensive stat superiority means that she's a great choice to have in the party. But compared to the other characters, she's ultimately not a priority for experience gain. Because other characters have so much more room to grow, Rose is sitting in a traffic jam while all the other characters are literally flying fighter jets. Literally. Because they can fly. Because they're dragoons. I mean, Rose can fly too, but you get where I'm going with this, right? One positive for Rose, though, is her above average speed. And I know, math is for nerds, but I am a nerd, so I'm here to tell you that her speed is at the median, but at least it's above the mean. However, that means that even though other characters can do more damage than she does in a single blow, she'll at least get more turns than Congo, Lavitz, and Dart, which will allow her to heal or defend more often if necessary. But defensively, though, Rose has some big issues. If you can guess how her defensive stats progress, I'll give you a cookie. And that cookie will crumble if you let it age just like Rose. Rose's HP stat is terrible, the second worst in the game, and while she starts out with great defensive stats, her growth in this arena also stagnates. As with her offense, she goes from being one of the strongest to arguably the weakest. While she doesn't have the absolutely weakest stats in any category, Meru has the lowest physical defense and Kongol the lowest magic defense, the fact that she excels in neither along with her low HP means that she's not the one. And of course, her higher speed allows her some more chances to recover HP by defending, which is is useful, but there are definitely better defensive characters to use, particularly if you know an enemy will specialize in physical or magic attacks. A specialist in physical or magical defense, like Kongol or Shanna respectively, will always perform better in the right circumstance. So in human form, Rose is initially a fantastic option to use offensively on the physical or magical sides, and she can leverage her mixed statistics to take on multiple roles. But as party levels increase, she is outstripped by her comrades in every aspect. She has middling offensive potential and is truly let down by her disappointing defenses and mediocre speed. She thus collapses under enemy offensive pressure and therefore cannot contribute as meaningfully to battles as her allies can after about the first quarter of the game. Rose's Dragoon form mitigates many of her weaknesses, allowing her not only to contribute offensively, but also to provide some utility. However, her Dragoon additions can wreck a although that's not typically her best use case for Dragoon offense. Which brings us to her spells. Rose's first spell is Astral Drain, but a more appropriate name for the spell might be Butt Blaster. Seriously, if Rose bottled her farts, she would be a multi-millionaire. Astral Drain is a 50% damage spell, and yes, that's correct, there's an error in the magic menu. It is not a 25% power spell. It is in fact 50. It drains the opponent's health and then provides that drained health to the party and that healing is split among them. It's on par with most other characters level 1 spells in terms of power, but its healing makes it an excellent early game choice. Now in many games, including in The Legend of Dragoon when you're looking at pure healing spells, most spells like this will overheal. In other words, if a character is close to full health, it will heal more than that amount to that character, wasting the healing. This spell, however, attempts not to do that. If a character's health reaches maximum, they will receive zero additional healing, and any extra healing will be distributed to the other party members. Now, this healing
feeling is not as powerful as that of Shanna or Meidu, particularly since it's lessened by the enemy's magic defense, but it can be very useful as an emergency measure, and the fact that it does damage at the same time is excellent. Death Dimension is Rose's level 2 spell. It's a 25% power spell that targets all enemies and causes the fear status effect. This spell is fine. I suppose the fear bonus is nice, but the fact is that most bosses are immune to fear, along with all other status effects. So on bosses at least, where you're most likely to use most if not all of your magic in optimal play, it's much better to use Astral Drain to get extra damage and some healing, or use an even more powerful spell. But unfortunately, unlike Shanna, who has a far superior magic attack stat, Rose just doesn't have the firepower to use a 25% attack spell effectively. Her third spell is Demon's Gate. Rose splits herself down the vagina to create a black hole that sucks in her enemies. Now, if I had a nickel for every time I went on a Tinder date and this happened to me, well, I'd have no nickels because they'd be sucked into the black hole and also I'd be dead. But in any case, this spell is largely worthless. It targets all enemies and it inflicts instant death. However, it uses 30 magic points, so it's not great for casual fights, and bosses are completely immune to it. Though I suppose it could get some use in the overworld, but it's definitely far better. Oh god, yawn, well. So I suppose it could get some use in the overworld, but it's definitely far better to level Rose's additions and just use Caboose Cannon as needed to damage enemies and heal. And Rose's final spell is the Dark Dragon Summon, a 100% strength dark spell that attacks a single enemy. And this spell is honestly just okay. The problem isn't that its damage is bad. In fact, it's the most damaging spell in her arsenal, and like other dragon summons, it creates a special field that enhances its own damage mark. Rather, the problem is that there's another character, and I'm going to talk about this character in a future review. It's a character that has lots more magic attack, 15 more speed, and a spell that does the exact same thing in the water element, Meidu. And the damage that Meidu can do with her dragon far outstrips this one. <laughs> But I suppose if you want to use Rose, this could be a good spell to use. But, and it's a big but, and it's not blasting you this time, there are only two bosses in the entire game that are light elemental, and there are many that are dark elemental. This can be good, I suppose, as it means Rose will take less damage from the enemy's elemental attacks, but it also means that her magic does a lot less damage, which sucks, because her dragon looks kind of badass. And the final problem is that Rose's dragoon form, just like her human form, suffers from her mediocre speed. That means, of course, that she'll get fewer attacks than faster characters, which leads to reduced damage output and reduced healing from Astral Drain. So in Dragoon form, Rose does less physical and magical damage than other party members do. She does have some extremely limited utility, but she just isn't a great choice after the early game. So overall, how bad is Rose actually? She is an amazing early game character, boasting better damage than the other party members with almost every attack, and her booty toots have excellent utility, providing a reasonable amount of healing and doing pretty good damage. But as she gains levels, she loses statistical ground compared to other characters, almost as if something is holding her back. I wonder what that could be. I'm sure it's nothing serious. While she gets a huge boost at the very end of the game, she's a suboptimal choice when compared to the alternatives, like Hashel. Hashel is a talented martial artist and a master of the Rouge School martial arts technique, which explains why he's soon going to star in the new remake of One Punch Man, in a twist that can only be described as shocking. Hashel ultimately becomes the Purple Dragoon. He mobilizes his electric magic as well as his skills in hand-to-hand -hand combat to omni-sweep up the competition. He's proof that old dogs can learn new tricks and they can do them better than the Zoomers that keep making fun of them on TikTok. So today, we're going to examine Hashel's battle potential. We ask, how great is Hashel actually? Hashel's human form has tremendous strengths. Offensively, he's often initially underestimated by players as he does not get his Dragoon Spirit until around a quarter of the way through the game. But even without it, he is a tremendous contributor to battle damage. His physical might is his strongest suit, and as he grows, the dominance of his stats when compared to his allies also grows. He starts with great attack, although his additions see some slow growth in power, particularly given his late entry. However, his later additions, particularly his final three, have huge damage multipliers that enhance 
his attack damage markedly. His final addition is the second strongest in the game. Just as importantly, his weapons are quite powerful and they deserve some individual attention. Because not only do they have great attack stats, but many of them also have unique effects. For random battles, his Beast Fang causes the stun status, preventing enemy attacks for three turns, and his Brass Knuckle can cause instant death. But the Thunder Fist, his second best weapon, can, for some battles, be a downgrade. The Thunder Fist deals electric elemental damage. The electric element has no opposite, meaning the weapon will not get enhanced damage against any enemies, but against electric enemies, it will do less damage than many weaker weapons as its attack will be resisted. And unfortunately, there are a couple of thunder-based bosses and plenty of thunder-based standard enemies that will be damaged less when Hazel attacks with this weapon. But his most unique weapon is his final weapon, the Destroyer Mace. It's only available late in the game, but it's novel enough that it's worth discussing. This weapon has an already excellent attack stat of 55, but at half health, the weapon deals 50% more damage. And at a quarter health, the weapon deals 100% more damage, effectively doubling its attack stat. This allows Hashel to be played in a high-risk, high-reward glass cannon playstyle. This playstyle might make Hashel prefer teammates like Albert, who can reduce the damage he takes and prolong his life rather than a healer like Meru or Shanna. Their healing is anti-synergistic with his final weapon effect and will ultimately reduce his power. While he certainly isn't my first choice to throw consumable items, Meru or Shanna hold down magical offense quite well, he is on par with or better than all of the other characters in the game. And I say that because his offensive potential is bolstered by his fantastic speed stat of 60. He outspeeds all other characters except Meru and Shanna. However, he fills more of a physical attacker role than they do, so you can simply let them use up all of your consumable items and have Hashel focus on what he's best at, slapping his enemies into submission. And defensively, Hashel is not at all slothful. His health pool, while not gargantuan, is adequate, and his defensive stats are middle of the road. And because of his great speed stat, he could fit in some defend commands if absolutely necessary to ensure his survival. But most importantly, because he is of the purple element, he has no elemental weaknesses. Every other character has an opposing element that does extra damage to them and makes them a liability in certain boss battles. But Hashel is a consistent, albeit not perfect, defensive choice in every single boss battle in the game, particularly against those that use the electric element. So in human form, Hashel provides excellent physical damage, passable magic damage, and reasonably mixed defenses. Given his preference for physical attacks, his magical acumen is still quite impressive when compared to the other characters, and he can be used effectively to throw an attack item in a pinch. He is also lightning quick, and his speed enhances all of his other characteristics. This allows him to defend or heal as needed, which patches up his one weak point. Hashel's Dragoon form isn't one I use often. The reason is kind of a story. When I first played this game, I played it on the PlayStation 2. That was about 15 years ago, and the word Zoomer didn't even exist back then. Anyway, the PS2 had a funny quirk. Whenever you dragooned on a specific battle, the entire game would freeze. It's kind of like what happened in the PS5 re-release, only it was just one battle. But I didn't know that as a kid, so I decided that I would just do an entire run where I didn't dragoon at all. I was absolutely terrified that it would happen again. And that run made me realize how little Hashel needs his dragoon spirit. However, if you don't want to limp through the game, there are a couple of compelling reasons to use Hashel's dragoon form. Of course, an enemy might have have high physical defense, or you might need the defense boost the Dragoon form provides, but more importantly, you might wish to use a special transformation with another Dragoon to enhance their magic damage. This will force Hashel to transform. Which brings us to Hashel's Dragoon additions. These are powerful, and they are a great source of damage. He gets a 150% base boost to his physical attack, and he uses it well to do great damage, making him an effective party member even after his MP has been drained. And his magic is also surprisingly strong. Hashel gets a a 200% base magic bonus. This excellently supplements his already good magic stat. As far as the spells go, ignore the in-game numbers and use these ones, please. The devs totally messed up the in-game descriptions and this video has the real deal. Hashel's first spell is Atomic Mind. This is a 25% single target attack spell. And honestly, it's not really worth using. Every other character in the game has more powerful spells, and this one just doesn't do much. His additions will be more powerful in almost every aspect. Thunder Kid is a 50% single target attack spell, and it's also not really worthwhile to use. 
Unfortunately, the MP cost is high compared to what other characters need for a similar level attack spell, so I wouldn't touch this one. Leave your kids out of this war. Yes, even the Thunder Kids. Thunder God is his third spell, and this is where things get spicy. It's a 75% power single target attack spell, and it costs 30 MP. Its damage output is on par with Dart's final burst, making it an excellent choice against any non-electric enemy. However, because it's the electric element, it gets no elemental boosts against any enemy. And if you need more information about how elements work, I put a lot of information about that in my tips and tricks for the Legend of Dragoon video, which I will put a link to in the doodly-doo. And I'll link it right here. In any case, Thunder God has a great MP cost to damage ratio, so if you special, this spell might be the play. It depends on how you set up Hashel's stats and which weapons you have available, because in some cases his Dragoon attack might be more powerful than this spell. Violet Dragon is his final spell, and this is a 100% power single enemy attack spell. It also does bonus damage because of the field effect all dragons create for themselves. And this spell is great to use for a burst of damage. Basically, if you're going to special anyway, have Hashel use this spell and use his physical additions for the rest of his turns. Now, you may have noticed something odd about Hashel's spells when compared to those of other characters. He only has single target attack spells and he has no supportive utility. And this is actually a good thing. It allows Hashel to focus on what he's good at, offense. However, it also means that he's probably not great to pair with someone like Kongol. Kongol has the same role as Hashel and the same role as Dart for that matter, although Dart is forced to be in the party so you can't fix that. But as I alluded to earlier, Hashel pairs back with more supportive teammates who can heal him, like Meru or Shanna, or to patch up his middling defenses, like Lavitz. So Hashel as a Dragoon is a good choice overall. Physically, he's quite adept, and his middling magic stat is propped up by his Dragoon bonuses. His weakness is his element, which does not allow him to get bonus damage for hitting enemies of the opposite alignment because Electric doesn't have an opposite element. His element ultimately acts as a strength, though, as he'll be quite bulky as a Dragoon as a result and will receive no super effective damage from enemies. So overall, how great is Hashel actually? Well, he's not good. He's great! His strong offenses combined with his excellent speed stat allow him to get in lots of attacks, both physical and magical, and his unique weapon options and powerful additions only improve his potential. Compared to the other characters, he gets huge stat growth in every stat from the mid-late game, surpassing almost everyone, particularly when he has his final weapon equipped. While he can't provide healing or stat boosts, his offense is good enough that outsourcing support to another character is actually ideal. This frees him up to do what he's best at, bonking his enemies with his enormous man hands. Using him with Albert, Meru, or Shanna is a great way to unleash his maximum potential. Like all members of the Giganto race, Kongol is extremely down to earth. He likes long walks on the beach, big dicks, and fried chicken, which explains why his final addition is Bone Crush. He's the juggernaut, the behemoth, the roid rage-fueled bodybuilder of the team. And I suppose it's also germane to mention that he is the gold dragoon and just an all-around simple guy who likes to smash. So today, we're going to examine Kongol's battle ability. Yes, he is dead last on my ultimate Legend of Dragoon character tier list, but he must have redeemed qualities. So in this video, we ask, how bad is Kongol actually? Kongol is a polarizing character, both in terms of fans' opinions of him and in terms of his stats. And while I usually organize these videos to talk about offense versus defense, with Kongol, it makes far more sense to talk exclusively about physical versus magical. So physically, Kongol is the strongest character in the game. He has amazing personal stats, both offensively and defensively, and his weapons and armor only bolster that strength. And for most of the game, his weapons give the strongest attack boost, much more than all of the other characters. His final weapon is only weaker than Rose's Dragon Buster, and his armors give him unparalleled physical defense. And while many feel that Kongol's additions let him down, and that's because his final addition only has a low 300% attack multiplier, and I mean low when compared to other characters, he only has three additions. This means that he can easily acquire his final addition with minimal grinding, and he can get it far earlier than other characters can. Kongol can bone crush me anytime. 
other characters will initially be stuck with similar or lower addition numbers while Kongle is hacking away. He does double or sometimes even triple the damage in one attack than the other party members. And once the other characters catch up, Kongle's attacks will still do more damage. The divide just won't be quite as wide as it is in the early part of the game. And unfortunately though, Kongle's human strengths end right here. Kongle is burdened with both the worst magic attack and the worst magic defense stats in the game. Throwing a magical item with Kongle is about as effective as telling Donald Trump he's f***ed up, and someone else will have to come in immediately afterwards to clean up the resulting mess. And while his incredible HP pool compensates for his defensive deficiency somewhat, there's no denying that he falls to magic attacks far more easily than his allies do. Except Lavitz, who, because of his lower HP pool, actually has a teensy bit less overall magical defense than Kongol does. But in any case, a strong wind can knock him right off of his feet. And I mean that literally, as he's weak to the wind element. And of course, that's not the worst of it. Not at all. In fact, Kongol's speed is the worst of it, and the worst of any character in the game. At a measly 30, he's about half as fast as the speediest characters in the game, meaning he'll get half as many turns. Which means, if those party members do at least half as much damage as Kongol does, they'll end up doing the same amount of damage overall. In addition, more turns compared to the enemy means more opportunities to heal or perform defensive actions in the case of an emergency, meaning as long as they don't get one-shotted by an enemy, they'll have more opportunities to recover than Kongol ever will, making them effectively more durable than he is in every single magical defensive situation. So in human form, Kongol is physically amazing but magically terrible, and his bargain basement speed stat makes slugs look like Olympic sprinters by comparison. Kongol's Dragoon form is like Pokémon's Articuno. Terribly difficult to use effectively in battle, but so cool looking that you just can't help it sometimes. Because the long and short of it is that the strengths and weaknesses of Kongol's Dragoon form are very similar to those of his human form. Physically though, Kongol's Dragoon form does have some advantages. He is offensively extremely reliable. Given his relatively low addition strength as a humanoid, the multipliers for his Dragoon additions are comparatively pretty generous. And he receives a standard 100 150% base physical attack boost, which complements his high native physical attack stat and the high power of his weapons, amplifying his damage markedly. And his physical defense is only further improved when he transforms, making him almost completely impervious to any physical onslaught. Magically though, the story is a lot different. Offensively, unlike all the other characters, Kongol only has three spells. Grand Stream is a 50% power earth spell that attacks all enemies, bathing them in a golden shadow. Hour. And given Kongol's terrible magic stat, it is truly never worth using. Meteor Strike is a 66% power earth spell that also attacks all enemies, bashing their heads in with a giant earth ball. And this spell too is not worth using due to Kongol's low magic stat, which results in him not being able to effectively use magic. And his final spell is the colossally powerful Gold Dragoon, a 100% power earth spell that does massive damage to all enemies. And you may be wondering, why is he being so positive about the dragon spell when he was so negative about the other ones. And there is a good reason for that. And the reason is that I'm lying. The spell is bad. Using magic with Kongol's Dragoon form is like attacking a ground-type Pokémon with Thunderbolt. It's like correcting someone's grammar when they say they literally died, and they actually literally died. It's like asking your mother-in-law to stop calling you a piece of trash because you don't have a real job because your YouTube channel is hugely successful and it's gonna blow up. And of course, I'm not saying that about me, but uh, sign up for channel memberships just in case I happen to have that fight in the uh, future. But anyway, what I mean to say is that if you use magic with Kongol in any form, it will be far less effective than just having him wham, bam, slam your opponents. Or hack, chop, cut, but you get the point. His axe has fur on it though, so I think the first one is a little more accurate. Let me know in the comments. But on the bright side, the magical defense boost he gets makes his dragoon form far more resistant to magic attacks and largely patches up that weakness. It's the same percentage boost that everyone else gets though, so Kongol is still relatively frail on the magical side, when compared to his allies. So he's certainly not invincible, but with the highest HP pool in the game, it's okay. He's gonna be fine. So overall, in Dragoon form, Kongol is a physical powerhouse, making firewood out of his enemies, but doing it very slowly. He should never use magic, and he can take some magical hits due to his Dragoon boost, which is something his human form cannot do. 
wow, this section is a little different from my other videos. I want to take my stupid no gaming development knowledge brain and give my thoughts as to what would actually make Kongol better while still keeping him balanced. Certainly all of these changes are not necessary to improve him, but given that I feel he's the worst character in the game by far, I think this section is absolutely necessary. Especially if you can't get enough of large, handsome, muscular men that you just want to f Okay, so first, focusing on what you as a player can do to make Kongol better, he needs speed. And you don't need to make any changes to the game to make that happen. You can just give him all of your speed equipment. He can get up to a speed of 70 with speed boosting items, which is honestly pretty admirable, all things considered. That's all he really needs to be a viable character. But his magic defense also sucks, and you can patch that up too. If you want to use him as a tank, the best way to do that if you don't feel like increasing his speed is with the physical ring. This item in increases HP by 50%, and since every healing source in The Legend of Dragoon is based on percent HP and not absolute HP, Kongol has everything to gain by equipping this item. But here's where I go off the mother rails. Hashel and Lavitz can do exactly what he can since Kongol has only offense, but Lavitz has a utility spell that boosts party defense, making him absolutely invaluable. But Kongol is the earth element, and to me, that element feels like it should have gotten some sort of defensive spell. So here are a couple of ideas about what the developers could have done to make Kongol more useful, and only one of these changes would make Kongol a lot more viable. First, I would love it if Kongol's second spell gave him an aura that allowed him to take physical attacks for another character for three whole turns. This would allow him to synergize perfectly with Meidu, and then she could go to town and attack her enemies even more wildly. And in this case, Kongol's low speed would be a boon, but perhaps to balance things, the spell would only allow Kongol to absorb two enemy physical attacks total, forcing him to recast every two times an enemy attacked. Or if that's too powerful, perhaps taking a magical attack removes the effect entirely. Or perhaps the way to go is that Kongol absorbs all attacks for another character, meaning that he gets sublimely punished if a magic attack is used by the enemy. And the second option is simply to give him a minor heal. Have one of his spells keep its attack and heal 12.5 HP to all characters not in Dragoon form. In other words, characters on the ground. And also make that spell heal status. No revival though, because I think that would be too overpowered. But this would give him something to do besides inflict damage, and it wouldn't be so strong that it invalidates any other character in their niche. And he has no use for his MP anyway, so why not? And one more, because I like things in three. One of his spells could allow him to sacrifice 20% of his HP for three turns while he attacks to do 1.5 times more damage. Or he could sacrifice 50% of his HP to double his speed. This would allow for a high risk, high reward strategy where Kongol can just blaze through the competition, but will be very frail and fall easily, and it would make him synergize very well with Lavitz. Lavitz could reduce the damage that he takes and prevent him from dying. What changes do you think could be made to Kongol to make him more viable? I am curious. Let me know in the comments. So overall, how bad is Kongol actually? Well, his strong physical stats make him an amazing physical tank and attacker, but his poor magic stats are disappointing, to say the least. He has nothing to do but raw physical offense, and so the biggest problem with him is that he's boring to play. I still think he's the worst character in the game, but I hope this video illustrates that he's very usable as a character. You just need to work around his unique strengths and weaknesses to optimize him. With a little more speed, he'd be much more viable, so he's a great choice to put all of your speed items on. As the Blue Dragoon, Meru is a moist powerhouse. In fact, she was originally going to play Katara in Avatar The Last Airbender, but that opportunity evaporated and she had to do this dumb video game instead. I don't know why they booked me on these chicken games. <laughs> she wields the power of water and ice and she's considered by many, including me, to be the best character in The Legend of Dragoon. But why? Is she really that good? Why does she make everyone so wet? So today, I'm going to to examine Meru's battle potential to answer the question, how great is Meru actually?
Meru's human form is confusing to many players. Offensively, it's probably easiest to start by talking about her magical ability. It's easy to see based on her raw stats alone that she is an excellent magic user. With the second best magic stat in the game, she gives Shanna a run for her money as far as magical strength is concerned, and she's a great choice to throw magical items. Physically though, I think many players find her confusing. Initially, she is the weakest addition user in the game. Her additions have low multipliers, her strength stat is only the second weakest in the game after Shanna's, but who cares about Shanna's strength, and her weapons have low attack additives. But as she grows in level and gains new additions, things vastly improve, with her second to last addition having a multiplier of 350%. However, it's not until she gains her final addition, Perky Step, that she truly hits her stride. It has a multiplier of 600%, the highest in the game. And alone, a 600% multiplier with low absolute attack stat probably doesn't seem that notable. However, Meru also has a a ton of speed. When comparing her to other characters, the number of turns she can take is just as important as the absolute amount of damage she can do with one attack. Perhaps it's easiest to understand when you compare her to Kongle and Lavitz. She gets about twice as many turns as each of them do, so if she's able to do only half as much damage as they can with each attack, she can still do about double their damage in total. And if she becomes low on health, oh, no. which I'll talk about in a moment, she can sacrifice one of her turns to heal and not lose as much damage as a slower character would by healing, because that slower character has to sacrifice their whole attack damage to do that healing. And of course, all of this completely ignores the damage she can do in her Dragoon form, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But all of this is to say that once she gets that final addition, her physical damage keeps up with or even exceeds that of the boys. And with speed equipment, no one can hit harder. But defensively, Meru is on thin ice. She has the worst HP in the game and the worst defense alongside it. And while her magic defense is excellent, second only to that of Shanna, her poor HP definitely hurts her ability to take a magical spanking. Particularly at lower levels, whether taking physical or magical hits, she'll often be the first to die. Her speed does help her get extra turns to heal though, meaning that if she isn't killed with just one hit, she can often spare a turn to heal. So her speed improves not only her physical prowess, but also her survivability. Ability. So in human form, Meru is an offensive powerhouse, using physical attacks and strong magic to bash her enemies' heads in with blazing speed. With lightning speed. With the speed of a Jamaican bobsledder. But her defense is as delicate as a doily, and like a goldfish, she needs careful care to ensure she does not meet an untimely demise. Meru's Dragoon form is a great reservoir of power and utility. She retains a great deal of the strength of her human form, but she gains a ton of cool tricks she can use to ice out the competition. Offensively, Meru's physical attacks are somewhat lackluster. She trades Perky Step's 600% attack multiplier for a 200% base strength multiplier, which is nothing to shake an ice cube at, and the standard Dragoon addition multiplier. And as I was writing this script, I realized that I haven't done a direct comparison of Dragoon Dragoon additions to standard editions, so look out for that video at a later date. However, if you play Meru's Dragoon form, it's likely that you'll end up using her additions, and fortunately, they're not terrible. They're just not as good as everyone else's. But fortunately, Meru has far better things to do in Dragoon form than use physical attacks. Her arsenal of water and ice magic contains some of the best spells in the game, spells that are versatile and worth using in myriad situations against many enemies. Her first spell is Freezing Ring, a 50% power ice spell that attacks a single target and costs 10 MP. And coming off of Meru's magic attack, this does a ton of damage. And because of its low MP cost, it can be used multiple times for a lot of damage output. And that low MP cost is important because her second spell, Rainbow Breath, is one that can absolutely save your butt. Rainbow Breath heals half of the party's HP and removes any status effects. And Meru's third spell is Diamond Dust, which is a 50% power water spell that attacks all enemies. And this spell, like her first two, is fantastic and probably the most efficient spell in the game in terms of damage to MP. And Meru's final spell is the Blue Dragon, a 100% power spell that attacks one enemy. And of course, transforming into a Dragoon shores up her defenses with tremendous boosts, meaning that with her healing, she will not die. And this section is a little bit different than what is in my other guides in this series, but I felt Meru's placement in my tier list as the best character in the game. 
game deserves some scrutiny. In any video game, there are specialists and all-rounders. For example, in Final Fantasy, black mages and white mages are specialists. They can perform black magic and white magic respectively, and they can do it very well. Red mages, by contrast, are all-rounders. They can cast both types of spells, but they are usually only about half as adept as either of the specialists. They also get some physical skill, but again, not as much as a physical specialist like a fighter or monk would have. And in The Legend of Dragoon, Meru is seen by many players as a magic specialist. She has excellent magic spells and an excellent magic attack stat that backs up the power of those spells. Supporting the hypothesis that she's a magical specialist is the fact that her physical attacks at the beginning of the game do a very small amount of damage when compared to those of the other characters. But as she grows, Meru reveals herself as an all-rounder. Her physical attack strength versions, and with her speed stat, she's ultimately able to keep up physically with every other physical attacker in the game in terms of overall damage dealt. But wait, that kind of goes against the idea of an all-rounder. That definition being that they should do less damage with their respective traits than specialists can. So then if Meru can do as much physical damage as the physical specialists, is she actually a physical specialist? Well, to answer that question, we have to compare her to Shanna, because Shanna is the only other character in the game who has a comparable magic stat, and she is the ultimate magic specialist. She can't do any significant physical damage. So comparing their offensive spells, Shanna has two offensive spells, Star Children, a 25% power spell that attacks all enemies for 20 MP, and her Dragon, which is a 75% power spell that attacks all enemies for 80 MP. Meru, however, has Freezing Ring and Diamond Dust, both of which will always do more damage than Star Children because of their higher power level. And Meru's Dragon has more power than Shanna's, meaning that in single target situations, it almost always does more damage as well. So I would say that offensively, Meru's Dragoon magic is better than Shanna's. So basically, Meru is an offensive all-rounder who can do the job of every single offensive specialist better than they can. But wait! What about healing? Well, the only other character with strong healing is Shanna. Her first is Moonlight, which heals one party member to full HP, revives them, and cures status, and her second is Gates of Heaven. And that spell heals all party members by 50% HP and revives them. So Gates of Heaven is arguably the more useful of Shanna's spells, given that it helps out everyone, but it costs 10 more MP than Meru's Rainbow Breath. And if everyone is alive, that makes the spell's effect the same as Rainbow Breath, but with no no status cure, which is another point for Meru. And Meru's spell does it for 10 fewer MP. And in battles where dragoons are weakened, Chana becomes a lot more difficult to get value out of because her human form has terrible physical attacks, which means that when you run out of magic attack items, Shanna can't do much, while Meru can still help out with physical attacks pretty adeptly. In fact, the only person that offers something Meru truly can't is Lavitz. His Rose Storm, which is the literal best spell in the game, Game, and you can see my Legend of Dragoon magic tier list if you want an explanation as to why, reduces all damage that the party takes by half. Coincidentally, they have great synergy because of this spell. Lavitz can prevent her from getting killed in one hit, basically making her invincible. But in any case, that's why Meru is the most broken character in the Legend of Dragoon. She can hit hard in the same way her allies can on both the physical and magic sides, and heal about as well as Shanna, making her a great choice for almost every battle. Meru's versatility leads to four interesting ways to play her, all of which can be used to adapt to literally any battle. The first is a hyper carry. In this playstyle, you load up your party with MP restoration items and have only Meru transform into a Dragoon. She can then immediately use her blue dragon spell, dealing massive damage, and she can cast Rainbow Breath when the party is low on HP. After each cast of her dragon, one of your human characters restores her MP, allowing her to cast blue dragon until the enemy is dead. The main advantage of this playstyle is that it allows allows for Meru to do the highest possible damage over five turns. The disadvantage is that you're going to have to purchase more MP healing items, although money isn't too scarce in this game. And Shanna can also use this playstyle. The difference is that when Shanna reverts back to human form, she has trouble dealing any kind of good physical damage, and Meru, when she reverts, can use physical attacks that do a ton of damage to regain her spirit points, letting her transform again. The second playstyle is Burst Offense, and this playstyle is ideal in battle where being a Dragoon will lead to certain death. 
namely those battles in which Dragoon forms are weakened, but it can be used against any enemy. Essentially, you never want your Dragoon level to be more than one. This ensures that after you transform and attack, you'll revert back to human form immediately and won't get bodied in your weakened Dragoon state. Just transform every single time your Dragoon level hits one and cast your most powerful spell and then restore MP at your leisure. Again, both Shanna and Meru can use this playstyle, but transforming into a Dragoon with just one Dragoon level brings your Dragoon points, your spirit points, back to zero. This means that literally half of the time, Shanna won't be able to do any damage at all. She'll have to hit the enemy with a weak attack to get back her spirit points. The third playstyle is special. If you want everyone to Dragoon and you don't feel like restoring Meru's MP, have her special to gain a huge boost to her magic damage. If she's at level 5, the maximum amount of damage that you'll do to a single target is with 5 freezing ring spells, so feel free to blast away. In a multi-target situation though, go for Diamond Dust. And it's in this playstyle that Meru really breaks away from Shanna. Because Shanna's level 2 spell is extremely weak, her only real choice is to cast her White Silver Dragoon and her level 2 spell unless you restore her MP. And because Dragoons can't use items, and all of your characters will be Dragoons, she's only going to be able to do that once. That will give her a total damage output of 100% Dragoon spell power. Meru, on the other hand, with 5 Freezing Rings, gets 250% Dragoon spell power. And if she needs to use Diamond Dust to hit a bunch of enemies, or to hit multiple targets in a boss fight, she can do up to 150% damage to the entire enemy party. Plus another 50% with Freezing Ring after her 90 HP use from Diamond Dust are gone. And the fourth playstyle is pure physical. As I mentioned, once Meru has Perky Step, her final edition, she does a ton of damage with her physical attacks, and there often isn't any need to transform into a Dragoon in the first place. So just go to town, and if you have Lavitz in your party to shore up her defenses, that's just an added bonus, because they are ideal teammates. So overall, how great is Meru? She can do everything that every other character can do about as well as they can, if not better. Her only weakness is her defense, which is mostly mitigated by her Dragoon form, her excellent speed, and her access to powerful and low-cost healing. And physically, she is actually almost as powerful as Kongol. Thanks for watching, like the video, join the Discord, become a channel member, bye-bye!